hello all uh, welcome to another video so in this video i want to talk about the questions that were asked from me by the interviewer uh, if you have watched my last video where i spoke about uh, how i was able to switch uh, as an as a site reliability engineer with almost 50 percent salary hike so i've spoken about the things that i uh, prepared well in that video so you can um, go ahead and watch it in this video, I want to talk about all the questions and answers uh, that are relevant to SRE and uh, these are the real questions that were asked from me and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the answers also so that you, you can prepare the same way as I did. <clears throat> Alright, so uh, I went through three rounds of interview. So there were many questions. So uh, this is the, uh, the uh, part one uh, of this interview series, you can say. So I'm going to come up with more uh, videos like that uh, after this. All right. So let's start with the with the first question. So uh, so as you can see on the screen, the question number one was how would you deploy an application to AWS? So in this question, the interviewer uh, did not specify is uh, if if the application is containerized or it is a or 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 if the application is a monolithic application. So since the interviewer did not specify, I wanted to keep my answer really simple and basic so that he does not, uh, you know, uh, cross question me. Okay. So let's see what I answered. So I told them that when a company wants to use AWS to deploy their workload or the applications, the first thing the company does is they create something called as landing zone. Okay, so I'm not going to go into details of landing zone. I have given you the URL. You can go through it yourself. If you have any doubts, you can always reach out to me in the comment section. All right. So uh, the first thing is to create a landing zone. So basically a landing zone, if I just give you a very high level overview, it is <clears throat> actually the uh, the type of infrastructure that you want to deploy your uh, applications in. For example, uh, I mean, you will have the dev environment, you will have the QA environment, you will have the production environment. So generally you will see multiple AWS accounts created uh, you know, uh, for a particular company before they can start deploying their applications into those. Okay. And once again, uh, uh, there are some other things as well attached to the uh, this landing zone. So you can go through this URL and uh, you can reach out to me if you have any doubts. Okay. So after the company has the landing zone, then <clears throat> So generally what happens, uh, we are going to create our own custom VPCs. So if you know that uh, in AWS, in each region, you have one default VPC, which is given by AWS to us uh, so that we can start using, I mean, we can uh, start deploying our applications in. But obviously this default VPC has a lot of limitations and uh, we cannot use it to deploy a production grid application. So what we do, we create our own VPCs. Within the VPCs, we know that we create our net gateways, internet gateways, security groups, etc. So that's what I told the interviewer that after we have our, our landing zone, we are going to get our VPCs with all these, these different resources that are part of it. Then if you want to deploy an application, say on, on a virtual machine or a VM. So in AWS, we uh, I mean call that an EC2 instance. So on top of this EC2 instance, you will, uh, I mean, the, the, the first thing is you have to create this EC2 instance. Once you have the instance created, okay, depending on what kind of application, either it will have internet access or it will not. Okay. So you know that when, when we are creating any EC2 instance, we have the option to choose the subnet, okay, whether public or private, where we can decide if the application is, is going to be internal application or is it going to be in a, 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 a uh, public facing application. <clears throat> okay. So depending on that, we will have to choose the right subnet. Okay. Within the VPC, then we are, uh, of course, we have to choose the right security group. The security group is going to control the inbound and outbound access to a, to a particular uh, EC2 instance. Okay. And to our application as well. Also, if the application needs auto scaling, then we can use the concept of auto scaling group. And also we have the option to attach this auto scaling group with a load balancer and uh, we can point this, this load balancer DNS 
to the DNS record in our hosted zone. Now, once again, uh, so this is very, very specific to uh, I mean what I used to do in my previous organization. So in my previous organization, we used to use external DNS uh, hosted zones in Route 53. So uh, that's what I have expanded here for them. So if you are using Route 53 as your DNS, then you have the option to create multiple DNS records depending on your application type and requirement and uh, the, the users can access the application using this DNS record. Okay. Uh, and one more thing I mentioned that, uh, I mean, once you have this instance uh, 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 up and running, then uh, you will have to install the application dependencies. So here I have I've just given him a very random example of a Java application where you have a jar file to deploy. Okay, so there what you have what you can do is the first thing is you have to deploy uh, I mean you have to install all the dependencies on this VM or EC2 instance and then you can deploy your jar file. Also if you need a database for your application then you can utilize uh, AWS's RDS service to uh, you know to store your database in. Okay and, and once again I mean this like a uh, uh, this question is very open-ended so it can have multiple different answers if you are uh, uncomfortable with a containerized application you can explain that as well but you should know all, all the core concepts because the the, the interviewer is going to uh, I mean, ask you some more questions on uh, on your answer okay so I mean you have to be really careful with that <clears throat> so here I just wanted to keep everything simple so I just gave him the example of a monolithic application that is to be deployed on an EC2 instance <clears throat> okay uh, once again, if you have any doubts related to any of these questions, you can always reach out to me in comment section. Okay, let's go to question number two. What measures have you taken to secure your EKS clusters? Okay, so in this regard, once again, there are so many things that you can do to secure your EKS cluster. So some of the points that I spoke about are these. So if you are using managed node groups, as is, is the case, with me so i mean where i where i used to work before this i used to use uh, these managed node groups within the, uh, uh, i mean within eks so i mean when you do that then aws is is going to uh, control a lot of the things okay so uh, aws is going to administer the worker node operating system the kubelet and the amis for you okay so i mean you don't have to worry about these things when you're using a managed node group with your eks cluster then we always try to disable our SSH access to the worker nodes wherever possible. And uh, this is actually part of AWS's best practices around security. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, in this, what we do, we try to use AWS's session manager or SSM service, which which is uh, we used to, uh, I mean, uh, which is used to create SSH access for you uh, on, on the browser itself without opening any SSH port on your EC2 instance because opening a port always opens a door for, for hackers to exploit it. So it is always best if you can use AWS's session manager to log into any of these uh, these worker nodes without allowing any port. Okay, so this is one of the things that you can say. Then do not use service accounts for authentication as the credentials associated are static in nature. Instead, RBAC or role-based access control is the best approach because it uses the principle of uh, least privileges to your AWS resources. Next is the cluster endpoint should be made private. Now, uh, by default, when you create an EKS cluster, you, you get a public endpoint by default. So uh, generally in, uh, in organizations, you will have these clusters as private. So you have to ensure that the cluster has a private endpoint. Next is, always try to run your applications as a non-root user okay then uh, as you know we can use cloud trail for any i mean for uh, for seeing all the api activities in a particular aws account or or inside the aks cluster or uh, or within the uh, within the uh, the uh, 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 applications deployed within the aks cluster so to do all that, to all to do all the auditing, you can use the CloudTrail service. The next is uh, you can use AWS KMS for for uh, rotating the customer managed keys. So if you're using any any customer managed uh, keys, you can use a KMS to rotate it. I think you can rotate it 
uh, e on yearly basis as far as i remember okay so this is again one of the uh, best practices around eks security then also you should have a robust security vulnerabilities management system within your eks cluster okay so once again uh, this this vulnerabilities management system can be uh, I mean, uh, different in, in 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 different organizations so i'm going to talk about it in another question in this video itself so these are some of the uh, answers that i gave but once again there are uh, uh, many other things that you can say to securing your eks cluster depending on uh, what you know <clears throat> all right let's move on to the next question so next question is yeah uh, 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 what is the toughest challenge that you have faced with eks clusters so so uh, this was my answer upgrading a cluster looks straightforward on paper but a lot of things uh, have to be taken care of before you can go for it the first thing is to uh, go through all the release notes in detail so whenever you have a new uh, eks version available you have to go through the release notes to understand the changes and how those changes are going to impact your applications okay so as i mentioned uh, we need to be careful with any any deprecated apis that might already be used with some of our applications so it's it, it becomes really critical to have a discussion with the developer team before doing anything even in, in the lower environment and uh, you know uh, just try to understand the impact of the change from their point of view as well and uh, as i mentioned always critical to have the complete testing done in the lower environments before uh, we can go for the production upgrade okay so this is one of the answers but again there can be other challenges as well but this is what i have uh, i mean experienced in my previous organization that i mean upgrading the cluster isn't isn't that straightforward as it seems on paper all right let's move on to the next question have you ever worked on remediating security vulnerabilities remediation <clears throat> okay so so once again i gave a very specific answer that i uh, was using in my previous organization so i told them uh, we were using a tool called uh, tenable uh, which is used to run scans in our, in our infrastructure this the scans can be both internal and external which means it can run an internal scan within uh, i mean within a private network of an organization or it can scan the external websites as well okay uh, so this tool was managed completely by the security team so what they did they run some scans using this tool and then they are going to share the report with the teams who are who are responsible for uh, remediating the vulnerabilities so that report will have the details like cve id the impact of uh, that particular vulnerability the remediation reference urls that, that you can go through to remedy so depending on the criticality of the vulnerability we had sls to fix these so when we are scanning any vulnerability <coughs> each vulnerability has some criticality attached to it i mean it can be a critical vulnerability it can be a high uh, high vulnerability it can be a, a, a the medium vulnerability or it can be a low vulnerability so depending on the score of uh, that vulnerability it is it is decided that i mean what should be the sla of that and accordingly we have to remediate all the security vulnerabilities in the environment so here i was using this tool called tenable but it can be any other tool as well so i mean you can use any any name which you are comfortable with and then i gave him a very uh, random example so for example a new php version is available which is able to fix some vulnerabilities reported on an application in production then we had to check with the application developer if we can go ahead with this change or not because sometimes the newer version is not compatible with our application so we always need to check with the developer if we can go for the change or not okay if they say yes then we will uh, apply the change in a lower environment first then the developers is are going to test it thoroughly and then they are going to share the results with us and if all all went well then we can do the same change in production also so this is what what i used to do okay then question number 5 what monitoring tools have you used can you explain what components did you monitor so here uh, you can choose the tool that you are uh, most comfortable with so i was using prometheus and grafana so i just spoke about that tool so i mean what i uh, told them i have used a prometheus to scrape metrics okay scrape spelling is incorrect let me correct that 
yeah so i have used a prometheus to scrape matrix uh, data and used a grafana to visualize it so generally uh, we have uh, multiple kubernetes clusters to monitor so we can scrape we can scrape matrix from control plane components like api server or core dns or or uh, uh, cube scheduler and on the worker nodes we can scrape container matrix using a kubelet's c advisor uh, we can also have access to the cube state matrix which means the cluster level matrix so we can also monitor deployments pods etc uh, also to get host level matrix like cpu memory and network we could use something called as a node exporters okay all these are uh, concepts of prometheus uh, tool okay then uh, i mean once we have these these matrix from a prometheus we can uh, visualize all the tool i mean all, all the data on on our grafana dashboards and uh, once again i gave this example let me correct the spelling of for here so we can visualize all this data from prometheus by using grafana dashboards uh, so i i gave uh, these examples like getting requests per minute from a, from a particular application we can get a dashboard for it if we want to count the number of 500 502 or 54 or 5 uh, or a 504 errors we can create a dashboard using our grafana tool so these are some of the questions once again this is only part one i'm going to come up with uh, i think at least uh, i mean one more part or uh, i mean maybe two two parts more to this series so that uh, i can cover all the questions uh, that were asked in the interview for me in three rounds that i had all right guys so uh, that's all i wanted to cover in this video once again if you have any doubts you can always reach out to me in comment section and i'm going to see you in the next one